Welcome and thank you for joining us for this uh, fourth seminar on the European Green Deal. Last week, we took a, a deep dive into recent developments in carbon capture and storage, uh, offshore wind and solar energy. And we were able to uh, connect companies and embassies who could exchange views on opportunities for market entry into a Europe that calls for green growth and a circular economy. Today, we will explore three other sectors that are important to the green transition, namely green shipping, hydrogen and batteries. The European Green Deal is the blueprint and the roadmap for the EU to make its climate ambitions a reality. At the same time, it's a strategy for sustainable and green growth. My name is Kjetil Elsebutangen and I'm your moderator for this seminar series where we try to provide you with information, uh, raise awareness and build competence about the European Green Deal. We are bringing you up to date on some of the key developments within green industries and research in Norway. And we will provide you with examples of ongoing projects and opportunities for cooperation. Today, we have assembled a panel of speakers that will shed light on green shipping, hydrogen and batteries. And uh, I encourage you to uh, raise your hand and ask questions towards the end of the first part of this seminar. And we also welcome your engagement in the chat where you can um, connect and, and uh, promote opportunities for cooperation. Like last week, this uh, seminar will be split in two parts. The first part will cover current issues in green uh, shipping, <coughs> hydrogen and batteries. And then in the second part, uh, it will be organized as a matchmaking event where registered participants will join parallel meetings for each of the three, these three sectors. And we were pleased to learn uh, that uh, already there has been some uh, follow-up on connections uh, made last week. Our first speaker today is Mr. Alexander Burmo. Uh, he's a senior advisor in the section for Europe and the inner market in the Ministry of Trade, uh, Industry and Fisheries. He will provide an update on various government processes relevant for the sectors that we are discussing here today, including the government's strategy on battery, as well as the green transition for the Norwegian industry. Alexander Burmo will be followed by Mr. Simon Clark, who is an expert on sustainable batteries and hydrogen energy storage. He's a research scientist and engineer at the Sintef Department for Sustainable Energy Technology in Trondheim. Simon will be followed by Mr. Narve Mjös, who is the director of the Green Shipping Program at DNV. Then we will hear from Mr. Björn Uttar Elset, uh, who is the manager of the Arena H2 cluster, Norwegian hydrogen cluster. The H2 cluster is working on several projects aiming to accelerate the development of new business opportunities within the hydrogen industry. So it's time to invite the first speaker to take the microphone and the screen, Mr. Alexander Burmo. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, Kjetil. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I, would, I would talk about what we call the green industrial push or uh, the green industrial lift and the relevant processes as Shetty told, told you. So uh, let's start um, with, with the first um, point of uh, that the Minister of Trade and Industry has been given the task to coordinate the government's goal for this industrial lift or the background for, for the relevant uh, ambitions in the government platform or the Hurdal platform is, of course, the market possibilities that arise as a consequence of European Green Deal and uh, Fit for 55. So, uh, with regards to that, those ambitions, um, uh, it, we, we also say that it's vital for the 50% um, uh, 
export target that we want to have in 2030 without oil and gas. So within uh, this green industrial push that I'm talking about, we have identified six relevant sectors. So these are hydrogen, offshore wind, CCS, batteries, a big uh, greener projects within the industrial processes, and then forest and bioeconomy. And of course, uh, what we are going to, I'm going to talk a bit about today, green shipping. So let's start uh, with the batteries. Um, as many of you might have read in, in the newspapers last week, the government will present a battery strategy. Um, the strategy is um, being written right now. The process started already in December. And, and the aim for this strategy is, is so that the Norwegian value creation can reach its maximum potential. It will also be a tool for policy development and it will illustrate government's commitment for players in the battery sector home and abroad. And next uh, week, uh, there will be a meeting on the 18th of February, which will allow stakeholders to provide input and share ideas about, about this strategy. And um, it is estimated uh, through the NHO project green electrical value chains that um, this the, the potential can be amount to 90 billion crowns, which is of course a high amount. All right, so let's let's move on to green shipping then, where we know already Norway is at the forefront, um, and we may, uh, believe that this is because of uh, the use of tenders and the, the use of green requirements in public tenders. That's the reason why Norway had the first LNG, world's first LNG ferry in 2000, the first uh, fully electric ferry in 2015, and by 2022 we have we will have 70 battery ferries uh, in Nor on Norwegian waters. Uh, by next year, the first offshore vessel fueled by ammonia will begin uh, its operations. Um, some plans. Uh, uh, on this sector for, from the government. There will be a green uh, policy package. Uh, it's on the way. Uh, there will be more requirements, green requirements. Amongst them are three, zero emission in new tenders for Paris by 2023. There will be requirements for low and zero emission in new tenders for speedboats in 2025. And uh, there will be requirements for low solutions from 2025 and zero emissions in 2030 in offshore supply vessels. Um, let's say also a bit about uh, the, the EU regulations on this area, because it's highly important. Um, several regulations which were presented in the, in the Fit for 55 package now in, back in July are relevant for the shipping industry and obviously fuel uh, EU maritime, the inclusion of shipping sector in, in the EU ETS and the directive for alternative fuels are important here, um, which we follow closely. And back in November, we, we submitted our input to the commission for the proposal on the regulation of alternative fuels. Okay, so, um, that was batteries and green shipping. Now let me take a bit about the strategical industrial partnership with the EU that we are planning. Uh, because in, in, in the Hurdalsplattform, um, the government uh, platform, there's a goal to establish a strategical industrial partnership with the EU. And, and this partnership is intended to be mutually beneficial for both the EU and Norway. Um, we believe that Norway can and will play an important role as the EU will reach its goals within climate, uh, strategical autonomy, sustainable economic growth, and energy security. And um, bear in mind now that regarding the strategical autonomy, the Ministry will present a mineral strategy shortly. And an important element here is, of course, sustainability within mining of these minerals, and we all know that the minerals are vital both for the green industrial uh, shift and and the strategic autonomy. And uh, 
even though that we are Norway is a member of the EEA in the single market through the EEA agreement, we have experienced some unfortunate consequences uh, of not taking full part of the EU process. Some of them are uh, the IPSE process on batteries and the EU UK free trade agreement where where batteries from Norway will be treated as not be treated as single market batteries if they were to be re-exported to the UK uh, from from France, for instance, if they if they originally come from Norway. So so the bottom line here uh, the, uh, with the regards to the strategic industrial partnership is that we now, together with other relevant ministries, are in the process of defining and establishing this partnership. And uh, later in, in February, the, the Prime Minister will visit Brussels and meet with the Commission, uh, with the President von der Leyen and also with Timmermans. And we hope to have an agreement on how to proceed by that visit. The last thing I will mention in my presentation today is, is that um, there are also ongoing bilateral agreements and talk with relevant countries regarding this green uh, industrial push. Uh, Minister Vestre has had a dialogue with his Finnish and Swedish counterparts regarding ex, uh, a cooperation of exporting green industrial products. Um, we acknowledge that especially batteries are relevant in, in the Nordic region. Uh, and and um, there's also already established a formal cooperation uh, in Vasa uh, between a Norwegian company, which I think is with us here today and, and local stakeholders. And uh, recently it has been agreed that Norway and Germany shall deepen its industrial and energy cooperation. We're now sorting out how this should be materialized. And we think that hydrogen is perhaps one of the most relevant of the six sectors that I mentioned in the start in, in Germany, but we will discuss this further with both German and Norwegian stakeholders. And of course, similar procedures are considered with rel other relevant EU countries. And here, input from you are highly valued. Let's say if it's offshore wind from France or CCS in Belgium, et cetera. Okay. So, so that was that was me, Chetil. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Simon Clark, who is working on designing the future of sustainable batteries and hydrogen energy storage. He coordinates the EU uh, project Hydra, which is developing sustainable next generation batteries for electric vehicles. High performance and affordable electric mobility is of course essential for the green transition. So we are interested to learn more about the latest developments in this field and how the developments in Norway also fit in with trends in Europe. So Simon, you are joining us now from uh, Trondheim, I believe. Welcome to the seminar. That's right. Thank you very much for the invitation and the, uh, the nice introduction. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Great. Then uh, we'll get started. So uh, yes, my name is uh, Dr. Simon Clark. I'm a research scientist focused on uh, battery and uh, hydrogen energy. And uh, today I'd like to give an overview of uh, some of the trends in the battery industry generally and how Norway fits into those. So first, let's take a step back and uh, go together, uh, take, a, take a trip to the past to a simpler time uh, called 2010. And back then the price of batteries was really quite uh, expensive. I mean, over, over $1,000 per kilowatt hour. And over the past 10 years, through a combination of research uh, improvements and uh, large scale uh, commercialization, we've managed to get the pack level price of batteries down to $137 per kilowatt hour. And that's had a great uh, benefit on uh, a lot of different kinds of industries and has led to the uptake of uh, batteries and in, in some new application areas. So everybody knows uh, electric vehicles, right? So if we uh, take that as an example, uh, back in 2010, there were only uh, 200,000 uh, global EV stock in the world. And over that 10-year uh, uh, period, that's grown to over 4 million. And we may be tempted as, as battery researchers and, and people in the industry to step back and say, wow, you know, we, we decreased the price by 90%. We grew the EV stock, you know, many times over that market. You know, we did it, everybody. We can all go on vacation. 
Uh, but unfortunately, that's not entirely the, uh, the case. If we look to the next 10 years, what we expect to see coming just dwarfs everything that we've seen. Uh, by 2030, under current policies, the IEA projects that uh, global EV stock will grow to 140 million units. And uh, if uh, we enact, uh, if we enact uh, supportive policies, that can be as much as 245. So uh, we've got some work to do over the next 10 years to help bring this vision of uh, sustainability and uh, clean electric transport uh, to reality. Uh, but every, everybody knows about EVs, you know, it gets in the in the news a lot, uh, but it's important to, to note that this is not the only uh, application area for batteries that we expect to see a lot of growth over the next uh, decade. Uh, stationary storage is uh, is growing quite a bit. Uh, as we try to uh, to enact the uh, European Union's goals for uh, emissions reduction to address climate change, uh, the uh, installed capacity of wind and solar is growing rapidly and will exceed that of coal, natural gas, and hydropower within this decade. And uh, in order to uh, enable that and stabilize the electric grid, we need large-scale energy storage. And batteries is not the uh, entirety of that picture, but it is an important part. And then we're also seeing growth in in areas that are that are kind of new and interesting, as the previous speaker talked about uh, electrification of maritime mobility. And uh, right now, there's more than uh, 200 new vessels uh, under construction uh, in uh, Europe to uh, to support that vision. And then finally, one one place where uh, Norway has really taken the the lead uh, on the international scale is uh, electrification of aviation. Uh, Norway aims for all domestic flights to be electric by 2040, and this is uh, often an, an overlooked uh, market area for uh, for batteries. The uh, Batteries Europe Working Group on Mobile Applications uh, projects that the global market size for uh, batteries in the aviation sector uh, will be uh, greater than 15 terawatt hours uh, per year by uh, 2030. And that includes both propulsion systems and non-propulsion systems. You know, modern day uh, modern day uh, planes contain a lot of uh, electronics. So overall, uh, you know, this just paints a picture of that over the next 10 years, a lot of different markets around the world are growing and the world needs better batteries. And it doesn't need them yesterday, it needs them today. And these batteries need to be reliable, they need to be affordable, they need to be low carbon, uh, they need to be high quality and they need to be cutting edge. And if we want to achieve those goals, what do we need? We need a place with an exceptional process industry. Uh, we need a place with low cost electricity, with a low carbon footprint. We need a place with a highly skilled technical workforce and world class research institutes. Where in the world can we find such a place? <laughs> You're sitting in it. Uh, Norway offers the battery industry everything it needs to build high quality batteries with one of the lowest carbon footprints in the world today. And this is something that's that's unique uh, in the world and certainly unique within Europe. And uh, we feel that battery manufacturing has a, a home in Norway. And if we take a step back and look at what's happening in the larger sense uh, within Europe, uh, the uh, the rise of gigafactories is clearly a, a trend uh, across across the continent, and I tend to have to update this slide, you know, every every few weeks because there's new gigafactories being announced uh, all all the time. And uh, Norway stands to to be a, a, benef a beneficiary of that trend. Uh, Norway has a strong history in electrification. Uh, of course, everybody knows that it was an early uh, adopter of electric vehicles, and uh, Within the industry, we also have a strong part of the value chain for lithium ion anode materials and uh, maritime battery pack suppliers. But we also have a bright future. Uh, two of the big gigafactories being con uh, constructed in uh, Europe today are in uh, Norway, one in uh, Moirana and one uh, in the south, uh, operated by Freer and Moro, respectively. And uh, that's also spurring the uh, growth of a support industry for second life and recycling uh, applications. So over the next 10 years, uh, I think we'll see a, a healthy growth in the Norwegian battery ecosystem across the entire value chain, from materials to cells to packs to second life and recycling. 
but it's not all a, a bright picture, right? Uh, this is all wonderful news, you know, for electrification, and we see, you know, the the finally the the adoption of, of clean technologies. But if we want to uh, to achieve these things, uh, we need a lot of materials, and some of these are critical. Uh, for example, here we see some uh, common materials in lithium-ion batteries and uh, the amount of those that the battery industry consumed in 2019. And if we look ahead to 2030, of course, it's just uh, it just dwarfs anything we've seen so far. So if we want to address this challenge in a sustainable uh, and, and cost effective way, which we must, we need uh, new solutions uh, to to improve the uh, the amount of energy that we can store in batteries and reduce our reliance on critical raw materials. And for that, uh, Norway is, is taking a seat at the table as a leader in uh, battery research and development uh, within Europe. We're a, a core partner of the uh, Battery 2030 Plus initiative, which uh, oversees all of the, uh, the uh, strategic research on batteries uh, within Europe, uh, setting the standards for battery development and writing the roadmap there. And uh, Norwegian partners are also a key uh, part in a lot of uh, uh, EU research projects, uh, one of which is, uh, is called BigMap. And BigMap is, is especially interesting because it seeks to totally redefine the way in which we, uh, we invent batteries. Uh, in the past, uh, it's, it's followed a, a trial and error kind of approach, and you can do one thing that's good for the anode, but then it's bad for the cathode, and it's just a very time-intensive and expensive process. And uh, BigMap is seeking to create an AI-orchestrated discovery platform that will take information from all of these different models and simulations and databases and combine that with uh, robots to do autonomous uh, high-throughput testing for materials and use that to uh, lead to a five to 10 times increase in the rate of new battery development. And uh, this I think is, is really critical for the future of the battery industry in uh, Norway and in Europe generally. At the moment, uh, of course, it can't be denied that uh, a lot of the uh, uh, pioneering and perfection of battery manufacturing has been done in Asia. Uh, and if we want to add uh, value to that system, then we need to start doing our own innovations and uh, R&D activities are a, a clear uh, uh, opportunity to, to do that. So finally, there's um, you know not a lot of time to go into all the details today, but uh, we do uh, publish uh, roadmaps and uh, we uh, the Battery 2030 Plus uh, Consortium has just released an open access uh, special issue of advanced energy materials that uh, highlights the roadmap for uh, battery development within Europe over the next 10 years and some specific parts of, uh, of achieving that and unifying battery data, uh, digitalizing the battery manufacturing process, et cetera. So uh, if this is something you're interested in, I would encourage you to, to read those, uh, those publications. And um, yeah, I'd just like to thank you for, for the invitation and for your time and, and attention. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Simon, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and and uh, I'm sure we will come back to that either in the Q&A or and definitely in the second part of, uh, of uh, the seminar today. So our third speaker today is Mr. Uh, Norve Mjøs, the director of uh, the Green Shipping Program at DNV. This program seeks to uh, establish the world's most efficient and environmentally friendly shipping. The size of the maritime transport industry means that it has to, that it has a significant effect on the environment. Now, um, I know that you are uh, working on pilots to test various solutions and we are interested in hearing what are the most promising ones and maybe also uh, looking into what kind of different solutions uh, do you think will be best suited for the different markets uh, including in Europe. So with this and probably many other questions also coming up, uh, please uh, Narve, you, uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much and thank you very much for the invitation uh, to be here today. Um, I highly appreciate. 
the green shipping program is not only a public private partnership program but it's also a tool for green competitiveness um, there is an ongoing paradigm shift in the maritime industry similar to what we saw when we went from uh, uh, from sail to um, uh, to to uh, damp etc um, and emissions will be regulated and get the cost both directly and indirectly. And we see increasingly green demand from the market, from investors, from employees, and in general from the public. In the program, we look at climate change and uh, new uh, requirement uh, as a significant business opportunity. The vision of the program is to establish the world's most efficient environmentally friendly shipping. And the program is about profitable emission, profitable emission reduction with a huge scaling potential globally, based on the strong position that the Norwegian maritime industry has in markets all over the world. It is about not only sustainable, but also cost effective uh, logistic solutions involving the cargo owners buying the transportation gives up the opportunity then to uh, make more cost effective solutions and uh, you can to a larger degree be able to justify the business cases. It is about green jobs and increased competitive advantage, primarily be, be with being first uh, with the demonstration projects, pilots with uh, different technologies and in different segments. And we would like to be a front runner in green shipping. So Norwegian, uh, in particular, the coastal shipping has become uh, an incubator and a platform for export of um, uh, uh, environmental technologies and green transportation services. <clears throat> we started up seven years ago in 2015 with uh, 16 private organizations and two ministries from the government that was uh, climate and environment and uh, uh, trade and industry. Uh, today we have grown to more than uh, uh, 100 participants altogether. Uh, the Green Shipping Program is uh, a, a joint effort. It's a dugnad and a common effort uh, where all uh, major players in the value chain are participating. That is cargo owners, that is uh, uh, um, uh, ship owners, ports, uh, shipyards, and vendors of technologies and services and green fuels, and also uh, various parts of uh, the public sector and the government. And uh, it's uh, vital then in our pilots to have all uh, key players in uh, the value chain uh, around the table. And a lot of the value adding is created by uh, uh, in workshops. This is the program in a nutshell. We execute studies, we initiate pilots, and we use our experiences uh, into um, uh, scaling. And we have uh, established uh, a service office for green fleet renewal, 100% paid uh, by the government. And we have one track for ship owner and one for cargo owners. Uh, we have, uh, or we are also facilitating dialogue and collaboration, such that politicians, public and private leaders can take informed decisions. And the program is, uh, uh, the, except for the service office for fleet renewal in Norway, uh, it's approximately uh, equal contribution uh, from the um, uh, from the government and from the private sector with respect to the financing. <clears throat> Most of the green technologies and fuels we have uh, in the maritime industry has initiated, have started with use uh, uh, in our fjords and among our islands. If we shall reach the Paris Agreement and the IMO targets, it's important that these uh, green technologies, they are able to make the steps and to make the voyage from the fjords and to short sea and deep sea shipping. Some technologies can do this, others not so much. Um, uh, we see that some of uh, 
the members of the green shipping program are deep sea ship owners that would like to learn from coastal shipping in such a way that they get a competitive advantage in their uh, core segment, deep sea shipping. Um, altogether, we have initiated 40 pilots in the green shipping program. In, uh, 11 of them are uh, uh, implemented or under realization. When we started up seven years ago, usually the fuel was LNG and we had the combination with battery and energy uh, efficiency measures. Uh, thereafter, we focus more on infrastructure. Look at the left side of this figure, we, uh, where we looked at the ports and green infrastructure. The last two years, we have financed, we have uh, focused uh, more on cargo owners and the finance sector with great success. So the cargo owners are typically the guy that shall pay a bit extra for the green investments. The, the finance sector is uh, the sector that shall give attractive loans for green investments and also uh, green uh, equity capital. Um, for the time, uh, with respect to green fuel, and in particular zero emission fuel, the, the story is like this, that uh, when you have short distances, it's typically batteries that are uh, the best fuel to use, if uh, in particular it's on regular trades. Um, for a bit longer distances, hydrogen, uh, most popular in Norway now, uh, uh, compressed hydrogen. And for longer distances, it's typical than um, uh, ammonia or methanol. Uh, but it could also be biofuels. In particular, biogas has a great potential with respect to fast results because you can immediately use it uh, uh, with, for instance, with LNG ships. Uh, so, uh, but it's also a limited how much, um, uh, let's say, uh, um, of, um, uh, of waste we have from man and animals and uh, also from, from forest, etc. So it's a limited resource there. Uh, for the time being, we have started up uh, four ammonia pilots, uh, one for ferries, uh, one for deep sea bulk, one for deep sea tanker, and one for a big sea trawler. The first one is with uh, Grig, the second one is uh, Equinor, and the third one is with Lierre. And uh, we will probably next month start up uh, uh, two uh, uh, methanol uh, pilots, uh, probably. And um, yeah, I can maybe comment also on the, the financing two degree shipping where we looked at the different fuels for deep sea shipping. Um, and we looked at uh, regulatory measures that we expect will come, CO2 prices, uh, new technologies. And uh, the whole thing ended up that KLP, the, the pilot owner, which is uh, a pension uh, fund, uh, they invested in green ammonia in the north of Norway, so therefore it's green. Um, this is uh, the Norwegian maritime battery story. In uh, 2011, the Norwegian Public Road Authority issued a development contract, which led to the all-electric battery ferry Ampere in 2015. Um, if the authorities, if the state had not done anything more, nothing industrial would happen. But uh, because uh, the provinces and the public road authorities, they um, issued uh, contracts with green procurement, typical 70% uh, economy and 30% um, uh, 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 greenhouse gases. This led to more than 70 battery all electric ferries uh, on our Norwegian waters uh, this year. 
And also, furthermore, it uh, has happened in such a way that um, uh, it has developed a very good and competitive industry with respect, with respect to battery related uh, uh, technologies and services. Um, the um, uh, maritime uh, market leader Corvus has their office in Norway. They have a market here worldwide of approximately 50%. Owners are typical uh, Hydro, Equinor, but also other participants. Uh, so uh, originally it was a Canadian company, but today it's uh, mostly a Norwegian company. And we also have, uh, um, we have uh, companies like ABB, Siemens, Kongsberg, uh, DNV, that are market leaders within their niches in relation to battery related systems. The key, so in Norway today, we have altogether uh, uh, 199 um, uh, battery powered ferries. Uh, most of these are hybrid or plug in hybrid, so they are not all electric, but still they uh, get emission stone and more uh, efficient operation of the engine system, etc. A key point here is that this would not be possible without the leadership from the state and green public procurement. And this is the most important thing that the government is should do in these days with respect to uh, the green shift, to create and help to create uh, the market for use of uh, green technologies and fuels. And um, this can be done in a lot of ways, for instance, uh, uh, within um, uh, within uh, uh, the construction sector, the government is very big, building roads, tunnels, etc. cetera. Um, and um, if you have criteria with uh, green procurement, and these criteria can uh, be, uh, will survive in the entire value chain, then there will also be green transportation, whether it is on land or in, on, on sea. So this should, should be done and the government should go for uh, in front and show the way. And this will give uh, a, a competitive advantage compared to uh, other countries if we are fast. But so far, we have been successful within the maritime industry in one sector, and that's the ferry sector, uh, not in other segments of the maritime industry. So lagging behind. Uh, when we started up 10 years ago, 10 to 12 years ago, it was approximately 10 uh, battery ferries or battery ships in operations or under construction. Today, there are more uh, than uh, 530. So an enormous uh, explosion with respect to number of battery ships. And we can see that there can be good synergies here with also uh, production of uh, battery cells in, uh, in Norway. So this is definitely an area where uh, Norway should put attention. At the end, my last slide, um, we are uh, in the mid of phase five with a growing number of participants. It's a new way of collaboration. It has received considerable attention and the Lloyd's List Global Environmental Award. And it's established as a formal project to promote the United Nations Sustainable Goals. And uh, we are still welcoming new participants. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you so much for uh, for giving us this overview of uh, the green shipping area and the pilots and the possibilities and also the importance that you uh, put on on green procurement. Um, we will now turn to our next uh, speaker, Mr. Bjorn Ottar Elset, who is here in the studio. Very very good. Uh, you're the manager of the Norwegian hydrogen cluster. And of course, hydrogen is now being uh, championed by politicians, by executives and by activists as the zero carbon fuel of the future. And uh, it's part of climate discussions for industries ranging from steel to shipping. And many new projects are coming up all the time. Um, so what are the latest developments in this field? And also, in what areas do you see 
the greatest potential for hyd hydrogen as a solution. So please. Thank you, Chetil. Uh, great to be here in the, in the studio in uh, downtown Oslo again. So uh, uh, I will be running a presentation in the, in the background while I'm, while I'm speaking. So for this is uh, shown, uh, I think it's, uh, is it, uh, is it okay? Yes. So uh, as Chetil said, uh, EU has uh, great ambitions for hydrogen and wants to lead. And I think uh, Europe is now actually leading this effort globally, which is uh, great to see. Uh, I think uh, hydrogen will play a significant role in the decarbonization of the whole energy system, which is important. It's not only the application areas. It can distribute energy across sectors and regions, and it can also provide system resilience for energy, uh, the energy system itself. And also, of course, build a new workforce with new uh, competence using, uh, of course, the oil and gas uh, competence, but also new, new uh, industries. And, and also can uh, create the millions of jobs that Europe needs. So there is an enormous amount of uh, uh, financial resource goes into this. Maybe you can go to the next one. Uh, we, we see that um, Europe is, uh, is actually leading when it comes to the number of uh, projects. You can see that on the slide here, which is great to see. It's not necessarily, necessarily uh, most money, but it's enormous amount of projects now in all countries in Europe, including Norway, Sweden, Denmark and the Nordics and even Iceland can play a role here. But of course, it's the biggest economies in, in uh, Europe now leading the efforts, uh, Germany and France, which is great to see. They are, uh, they are in the forefront, but it can be very interesting application areas and pilots in the, in the smaller countries. And I think we all can play a, a, a role here. Uh, also, maybe the next one, we can also look at the map when it comes to Europe. Uh, you see that Norway actually has is the dark green here, meaning that we also have, uh, we are among the countries with the most uh, projects uh, in, in numbers, not necessarily the money. We have, a, I would say, a strong uh, uh, strategy and a roadmap uh, and very interesting uh, projects in, in the demo demonstration region. And of course, now we will have to go to, to the next phase and we hope for the new government also to uh, come up with new efforts. Although we have seen a lot of interesting projects already. I'll come back to that. So just an example, Germany, 9 million. 9 billion euros, 40 measures over the complete value chain and dedicated work on regulations and directives to stimulate the development also in, in the hydrogen stations and vehicles. And similar efforts is put in, in France, so that's uh, great to see. On regulation, we can talk uh, long about regulation. It's necessary to regulate uh, also this industry based on what we've done before. It's uh, safety issues and things like that. But also on the financial side, we can introduce a new instruments like uh, something called the contract for differences where you can actually make a hydrogen cdf uh, where you can um, kind of pay the difference what the fossil solution can be and, and a fossil free solution so this could be great as an instrument for uh, investors to invest more in hydrogen in this phase where we are starting um, also the global demand maybe you can go to the next one here it's a very interesting um, slide uh, from from Stotcraft. they're doing uh, this yearly analysis about uh, uh, on low emission scenarios you see that there is definitely exponential uh, growth there you will see a, a lot of uh, hydrogen going into the industry as a new feedstock replacing coal we have a pilot product that already uh, financed by nova starting up uh, soon you will see a lot in transportation we have talked about um, uh, shipping, of course, but also on, on trucks, some buses, and even uh, maybe not the personal cars. That that will be for batteries, I think, for a long time. But you can see niche uh, markets like taxis, for instance, where we already have, they have some products in, in, in the Oslo region. Uh, also about transportation, we need to uh, realize that we can be a leader in the maritime uh, hydrogen business. We have a strong Strong cluster actually only working for on the ocean maritime hydrogen solutions up in Flora. So, and we also see hydrogen as a good solution for heavy duty trucks. Uh, later, we can also look at aviation. Uh, Simon uh, also pointed to that. It could be both uh, electric planes for short uh, distances, but also for long distances. Uh, Oslo Trump's uh, Oslo. Uh, Netherlands and all around Europe, I think you will see hydrogen planes based on fuel cells. But of course, it's not only 
batteries versus uh, fuel cells, there is definitely a competition. I think they both have advantages and strongholds, but you can also see them working together. There is this company in Bergen, Corvus, they are saying that they want to use f adding fuel cells to battery technology as an important element uh, of the energy this transition to reduce emissions from shipping. So they can also work together. It's not only either or. So I think batteries and hydrogen can work together. This is a, a message. But of course, we need uh, infrastructure. Uh, we, we need uh, the filling stations, both uh, on land and, and along the coast. So this, this is an ongoing project and NOVA is definitely stimulating that. I think that's a good thing to see. On the, on the ecosystem, next slide please, we can, um, uh, yeah, we can uh, go to the next one actually, the ecosystem, uh, more. Yeah, just an example. Uh, this, these are not all the players in, in, in Norway, but they are the key ones, I think. You have Stutchcraft in the lead on the green hydrogen. You have Equinor, both blue and green. You have Yara on green ammonia. You have Norsk Hydro through the company Havran going for hydrogen. And uh, other companies like Nell, which is part of the history, they are producing global leading electrolyzers. We have world class fuel cell providers and also storage uh, providers. And also with a strong R&D sector with Sintef, NTNU, University in Oslo, Bergen, elsewhere, we have strong universities and also the business schools are starting to analyze, uh, uh, analyze the hydrogen business as such. So there is no time to go through all the projects. I would just show a few examples here at the end. There are uh, maybe 50 now, we're trying to collect them. And uh, this is part of our work in the cluster to collect uh, the clusters. They're both privately fun funded and, and, um, and public-private partnership. But th there is a lot of private money now going into the uh, hydrogen business. Some of them even go into the stock exchange. You probably read about some of them on the Euro Euronext Growth uh, Stock Exchange as well. But one project is, is a kind of a yeah, lighthouse project, I would say. This will happen um, in, in some years, but it's, it's a huge development making green ammonia at Heria, which is part of the strong history that Norway has in hydrogen. Next slide will show a, a bulk ship development um, uh, through uh, Heidelberg, bringing um, corn from East Norway to West Norway and, and stone from West Norway to, to East Norway. And this was a strong competition with strong shipping companies who won that contract. So that's great to see. We can see that maybe also in other places in Europe. Last uh, examples, uh, I think Nora mentioned it, it's important that you have the procurement system and Statens Weiwesen, the road authority, actually now announced that they are putting 4.9 billion Norwegian kroner for a project uh, that will operate ferries in Lofoten, between Bode and Lofoten. So that's great to see. This has a huge impact and can really show the way for Europe. So lastly, I just want to mention that we are, we are, uh, we are, we should gather the, the, the country, we should gather the, um, the team that can uh, build this hydrogen future. We should make uh, national narratives and international narratives. And we've done a project now called in the strategic position together with Innovation Norway and a communication company. So we need to make that narrative strong, pioneering hydrogen solutions together. So finally, yes, there will be exponential growth. Yes, there will both be blue and green hydrogen will play a key role. The end game will probably be green, but blue can be an enabler in this transition phase that we're into now. So thank you for the uh, uh, attention. I'd like to work with all of you, uh, the clusters, the embassies, Team Norway and innovation to create a great hydrogen future for Norway. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pironta. Uh, very interesting. We now have uh, a few minutes before we move over to the second uh, part of today's seminar, the matchmaking session. Uh, don't hesitate to raise your hand now if you have any questions. I know there is usually a little bit of a, a lag, but we have already one. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Gerber van Erwin from uh, our embassy in The Hague, the Netherlands, please. Yes, thank you very much, and uh, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, very interesting. Uh, actually, my question is uh, to to Bjorn Elset. Um, uh, Norway is indeed uh, very far when it comes to hydrogen, both blue and and green production. 
And the Netherlands is also very ambitious when it comes to uh, to to hydrogen, with uh, a lot of projects going on. Rotterdam wanting to be the uh, the hydrogen hub for Europe. Um, but what is very much discussed here is indeed the certification of of hydrogen, because you can also make grey hydrogen, of course. And uh, if if trucks are using grey hydrogen, that's uh, perhaps not polluting in the in the streets, but it's still polluting somewhere. So. Um, can Norway play a role in also this discussion on the certification of, of, of hydrogen? Uh, thank you, uh, Gerber. Uh, it was actually the last slide was from Holland. It's the, this hydrogen rocks was made from TU Delft, where I actually studied a long time ago. So that's an interesting point. But on, on, on the case, yes, I think we can do that. We have, a, of course, a strong uh, certification agency in a company in Norway called DNV. But if we are the front runners, for instance, on, on the land transportation, and even on, on, on the maritime stuff, I think we can we can play a role here. But this is the European effort, so of course you have to work with all uh, all players. Uh, and and I like to work with the in the with Holland there. I think these companies also has a stronghold in, in in the Netherlands. So yes, definitely, it's uh, something we can lead. Maybe we can lead um, the Germans and the French uh, on, on on that one. Yes. And uh, Narve, would you also like to come in on this one? Yeah, I I would like to do that because it's a very uh, important topic uh, and uh, we are discussing two types of uh, of certification one then uh, that is about uh, the fuel itself in relation to uh, showing that the customer gets what he is paying for so if you are if you are paying for green uh, hydrogen then it should <laughs> be green uh, and not gray uh, uh, hydrogen so that's one thing. Uh, we are encouraging our people in DNV to start to do things there. And if we have, um, let's say, pilot projects that are coming up, um, I can be glad to um, uh, make contact with you in such a way because we need to have to start with 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 some project one place or the other. Uh, the other the other certification is of course. Uh, safety certification because uh, hydrogen is as any other uh, fuel dangerous and it has to be handled uh, with care so uh, for instance um, there is within the maritime area it is not any certification scheme as of today which is uh, hydrogen specific uh, that goes for IMO, that goes for the, uh, the Ouija maritime authorities, and that goes for DNB as well. Uh, so it is a tricky uh, fuel in relation to safety certification. And we saw that in Norway also, we had an accident uh, in Sandvika uh, with respect to a, a hydrogen fuel station for cars. So uh, 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 I think uh, it's extremely important that enough resources are put in in such a way that we get uh, a good scientific basis to um, uh, develop uh, hydrogen specific certification schemes. On uh, road, on land, and also the, we have uh, DSP, the, the, the authorities then, and they have uh, 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 at least uh, uh, requirements in relation to this, but uh, uh, limited with testing so far, uh, my uh, my uh, impression is. Thank you, Narve. Uh, I think we have uh, the next question from Mr. Torstein Wangen, um, embassy in, is it Bucharest? Bucharest. Thank you very Please. much. Thank you very much for very good presentations. I have a question related to the role of the embassies. Uh, we have a lot of information on Norwegian priorities, but I guess that the role of the embassies will depend on business interest in each and every country. So my question is, is it possible that we could have some sort of mapping where you indicate where the different products might be of interest in a specific market. I like very much the map from Norskydro, in which at least we saw some priorities related to some activities. This would, of course, be easier for us to know what could be overall. 
we have two different approaches to, to come to a conclusion. We could, of course, make market reports and send them back to the different companies. This is very, it's a very difficult job for us to do. And even if are good sellers might be that the priorities of the business are a different one. The other way is more the bottom up. We could talk with the companies in our own country and try to find out in what way they would be interested in Norwegian priorities. But of course, this would also be easier if you had a mapping on different activities in different countries, and that might be different. In some countries, it might be that we inform about activities. In other, com in other countries, it might be that we could support initiatives between companies in the different countries. Thank you. Thank you, Torstein. Would you like to comment on that, uh, maybe? Yes, thank you, Torstein. Great uh, question. I think we can do a lot. It, it's not as easy as it, um, it, <laughs> as it said, but uh, we need to work together uh, with the companies. Obviously, they have their own plans. Uh, sometimes they can be public, sometimes cannot be uh, public, but to gather kind of the most uh, relevant project for many of the large scale projects coming up would be a good idea. There will always be some niche areas where I think company will, will uh, for instance, the larger companies will retreat uh, the, themselves, but uh, and having direct contact with the, with the embassies, but they have some kind of a system there. There are actually some initiatives. Uh, one of them is Hilo, which are gathering all the projects, but to make that overview and the system working, it's, it's a hard job and Innovation Norway has recently taken initiative to work together with the clusters, which uh, of course I like as a cluster manager. So we'll try to alleviate and make the job easier for, for the companies, because of course it requires persistence, at least for the many of the ambitious SMEs to go to all these markets so we can all help them. That, that's the message. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Uh, Narve, would you like also to comment on that question specifically? Yes, I would like to do that uh, in particular, because it's a good question. Um, we have started up a type of export pilot now uh, with uh, Greece. And the story there is that um, uh, the embassy Food and with Food and Andersen, uh, they had, um, um, they, they saw that there was an increasing interest in, uh, in Greece with respect to maritime batteries. Um, and uh, then uh, they invited for a seminar, yeah, maybe six to 12 months ago, uh, three companies uh, from Norway and three from Greece, and Fuda was also there, etc. And um, we got, I at least got some feeling with the increasing interest for maritime batteries in, in, in Greece. So uh, when we saw that this uh, export council uh, for, for the government, uh, came up now, uh, we thought that maybe we should try to, to establish a pilot because we are pilot guys. We don't start with generalities. We start with concrete things and then we see how it goes and then we do things uh, with, with the more general things afterwards. So, uh, so then we started, uh, we, um, we uh, decided to start up uh, a pilot in Greece. Uh, uh, we uh, invited Corvus, the market leader uh, in maritime batteries worldwide, into to the pilot to become the pilot owner of this pilot. And uh, then we invited DNV in Greece to, uh, to come on board and Ford Andersen there. So now we have started development uh, in such a way that we try to test out how can industry and uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs collaborate in a new way. And the key is, of course, open and honest communication and market orientation. So what we have started up with now is, is to try to understand the ferry business in, in Greece, because it's different from Norway, definitely, but we don't know who it is. Who is paying to whom and what are the key players? That's the first thing you need to know. And with uh, a forward-leaning ambassador, things are going in the right direction. So this is very interesting. So this in, is an example how things can be done. But uh, the first initiative really came from Greece and the embassy there. Hello, uh, Yeah, please. <laughs> I have a question for you, follow-up question. Uh, regarding Greece, 
Uh, have you been in? Uh, are, are you aligned with the EEA grants and the team working uh, in this respect, on behalf of Innovation yeah. Norway? Yeah, that was the, one of the first things we did. Good. But uh, my understanding is that this is take is taking so long time, but we can't wait for it. We just have to okay. go. And yeah. if there is coming some money later on, that's that is fantastic. Uh, uh, but uh, and and that is in general. I mean, uh, this is a green shift, and we don't have a lot of time. We must be faster. Yeah, and that I just would like to mention, Alve. Sorry for interrupting you. I would yeah. like to mention that there will be an event in uh, in Greece in May, in uh, relation to the EE grant. So, but that is something we can talk talk about later. Yeah, I'm already uh, signed up for that. Good. <laughs> okay. Can I can I also bring in Simon? Are you still with? Simon, are you still with us uh, here? Yes, I, I would like to, because you, you presented a very convincing case of why Norway is uh, such uh, well suited for batteries uh, with the various uh, components that you've put up. But uh, we also know that the competition is very hard and that European countries are really now investing and prioritizing this um, uh, and it's both money but also political attention we see now under the french eu presidency how they take politicians to go to battery factories etc and really emphasizing their own uh, workplaces and their own industries so can you say something about how you see the norwegian actors possibility to retain their their edge, their competitive edge, when this is moving so fast uh, in in the rest of Europe. Sure. Yeah, it's it's really kind of interesting how how batteries have become a, a matter of national pride almost. That each each nation is is very proud of their their capacity. Uh, but going forward, Nor Norway does have like some some uh, areas of uh, strategic advantage that I think will will continue to play to our benefit when when competing with other nations uh, in in Europe. Uh, one of those is the low carbon footprint of battery cells made in in Norway. Uh, over the uh, uh, in the future, the uh, carbon footprint of batteries is going to become very important, and for cells made in countries that rely on coal, for example, have coal uh, fired uh, power grids. Uh, that uh, could be a challenge, but Norway being uh, hydropowered and very low carbon is uh, is a, a area of um, strategic uh, uh, advantage. Also, uh, the it's it's often overlooked the difficulty uh, of uh, producing batteries on a gigafactory scale. Uh, a, a given gigafactory is going to be producing hundreds of millions or billions of cells every year. And try doing anything a billion times and getting the same result. It's it's very difficult, and especially in something like batteries, where uh, even small changes can have big impacts on performance and lifetime. Having a uh, an industry that's already uh, uh, developed in in terms of having good process uh, technology and uh, and good quality control is also a, uh, a strategic benefit. Uh, finally, the uh, the cost of electricity, which is maybe today not the best thing to, <laughs> to talk about in Norway, but historically, at least and hopefully in the future, will also uh, play a play a role in uh, in Norwegian competitiveness. The uh, batteries can be a uh, relatively ener energy intensive to uh, to create, and uh, shaving uh, costs off the uh, the electricity price uh, during the production uh, can can have a, a meaningful impact on cell level prices down the line. So there's, I think it's it's going to end up being a combination of uh, of a few things. There's no like one silver bullet to say, okay, if we do this, then we'll be you know the best battery manufacturing country in Europe. But we have enough uh, footholds and enough things we can grab onto and build onto uh, that we can we can make Norway competitive not only in Europe but in the world. Thank you so much, uh, Simon. Uh, I see that uh, the time is running. So we are now going to move into the second uh, part of this uh, seminar, which is the matchmaking. Um, uh, and there will be then three parallel uh, groups. Um, now, uh, if you are not taking part in the matchmaking session, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we uh, then uh, conclude uh, our seminar series today, but our work will certainly continue. And we will invite all uh, participants later to a brief survey about the seminar. 
and, and all the information that we gather from this survey and feedback uh, from stakeholders will be carefully analyzed. And it will inform our work on how to encourage connections between uh, <coughs> opportunities and actors. And we will certainly also share all the information that is relevant from these seminars and also the contact details that hopefully you will uh, will be useful uh, for you. So um, um, if you are then joining us for the matchmaking, we ask that you stay online and there will be then um, a first group on green shipping uh, will be moderated by Roger Martinson. The second group uh, on hydrogen will be moderated by Ivar Jo Baunbeck Tayen, and the third group on batteries is moderated by Benedicte Fasmer Voller. Um, so we will now uh, you have to switch the rooms. Uh, the moderators will uh, start the session by explaining the format. We hope you enjoy that, and uh, we will see you back here just before uh, twelve o'clock. So it's time to transfer to the to the breakout rooms. Okay, welcome back to uh, to the plenary. Um, I hope that you found the uh, the matchmaking sessions uh, practical and useful, and that you had the chance to to take the floor and exchange information both from the embassies and and the companies. Um, as I mentioned before the break, we will follow up with a brief survey, and we hope you will take the time to to help us answer some of the questions that will help us uh, in the next turn to, to continue our work to, to facilitate connections. As for our embassies, we will continue to follow up uh, with you on Norwegian priorities for the European Green Deal uh, in uh, the best possible way. And, and we believe that there has been a valuable dialogue throughout these seminars and that we can build on, on those going forward. So it's, it's really just for me to, to wrap up uh, and thank also the participants today, the moderators and the panelists, uh, and of course, those of you who are uh, online and of course, all the, the participants. So thank you so much and uh, goodbye and have a nice day.